Chemical control? I sweat and shake, hear me moan, oh no, my hormones. The endocrine system. All right, a little bit of uh, history here. So uh, again, I, I love going back to these uh, non-Eurocentric examples of advanced medicine thousands of years uh, ago. So here is a text um, uh, called the Inner Canon of Huang Quang Di. I, I believe that is the correct uh, pronunciation. If, if anybody, is that Mandarin? Can anybody pronounce Mandarin in the room? Yes, it is. No, not in the room. Okay, Huang Di. There you go. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, Chinese medicine had begun to isolate um, pituitary and uh, sex hormones from urine, uh, being able to, to do urine distillates uh, of these hormones uh, that were being excreted over 2,000 years ago, uh, which to me is just uh, astounding. And then taking these isolates and using them uh, to treat various ailments quite in line with the functions that those steroid, uh, those pituitary hormones uh, are, are their initial purpose uh, is for, their initial function. So um, yeah, there has been a recognition, at least in uh, Eastern medicine, for a very long time that there are chemical components of control uh, that, uh, that affect um, a, the wide range of functions in your body. Uh, the Europeans caught up about 2,000 years later. Uh, this guy, Arnold Berthold, uh, in 1849, uh, he made this observation that um, cockerels, uh, which are roosters that have had their male bits uh, whacked off, um, they didn't develop combs uh, on the top of their head and wattles, uh, which are gender-related uh, characteristics the way a typical rooster may. So here in this pattern, uh, this picture on the bottom, we see a standard rooster. And here's the same breed of rooster, but now as a cockerel uh, that has been uh, emasculated. And we see the significantly reduced combs and waddles in these, in these uh, birds. Um, and this led him to investigate uh, the role of sex hormones uh, in, in these birds and then by uh, extension in, in humans. All right, so I'll, I'll leave the history off there. Um, what composes the endocrine system? Well, we talked about this on the first day of class. Um, these are the, the tissues. So maybe at the top of the pyramid, uh, you could put the hypothalamus. Um, and uh, the hypothalamus is uh, responsible for production of a, of a host of uh, endocrine hormones um, itself, as well as exerting uh, other controls on the pituitary gland, which uh, really is the, the control center of, um, of the endocrine system. So the hypothalamus produces oxytocin, um, uh, antidiuretic hormone, other regulatory horm hormones. Uh, the pituitary gland, which is uh, adjacent to the hypothalamus, uh, also called the hypophysis, is broken up into two regions, uh, the adenohypophysis or adenohypophysis and the neurohypophysis. Um, so that adenohypophysis is uh, the anterior lobe and has a, a wide range of hormones it makes. And the neurohypophysis is in the, in the back, in the posterior lobe. Uh, and this is where the oxytocin and ADH uh, that are produced, the antidiuretic hormone that are produced in the hypothalamus are actually re released. And we'll talk about the mechanism of that uh, in a bit. The pineal gland is where melatonin is produced, uh, synthesized by the conversion of serotonin into melatonin. Me melatonin uh, uh, is responsible for circadian rhythms. It is uh, a compound that uh, 
uh, brings on uh, somnolence or sleep. Um, pineal gland, I, I had mentioned it uh, when we were talking about the brain being the uh, third eye of the brain, right? So there are photoreceptors on the pineal gland uh, back uh, down the evolutionary tree when this organ was developed by uh, reptiles. Um, it was actually on the surface of the skin. So you can look at uh, a modern day iguana and find the pineal eye on the surface of uh, the back of their head. Um, Non-image forming, non-image forming, uh, just photoreceptive. Uh, they don't, well, I'm not really sure what uh, an iguana senses through its pineal gland, but I'm imagining it doesn't sense anything different than we sense uh, through our pineal gland, a sense of sleepiness when it gets dark, um, you know, th those kinds of, of things. So it's not forming an image, it's not a sensory organ, but it is uh, receiving input from uh, the sun. Uh, the parathyroid glands, we talked about those uh, for the production of parathyroid hormone. Uh, the thyroid gland, uh, obviously, uh, beside the parathyroid gland, uh, we'll talk about that in quite uh, great detail. The heart is uh, responsible for producing uh, the natriuretic peptides. Um, we're not going to get a chance to talk about that much. Um, the thyroid gland. So, thyroid gland is producing thyroxine and, and thyroxine and triiodo, iodo, uh, thyronine, and calcitonin. Uh, So-called T4 and T3 uh, because of so designated because of the number of iodine that uh, each of those compounds contains. Um, so, iodine is a very important nutrient for the function of uh, the thyroid gland. Um, the thymus. Uh, <clears throat> so the thymus is uh, active in the infant during thymic deletion. I believe I discussed thymic deletion with you guys, uh, but it atrophies. Uh, at this point in your lives, there's not much thymus left. The suprarenal glands divided into a number of regions responsible for producing epinephrine, norepinephrine in the medulla, and then the um, stress hormones, the cortisol and the corticosterones, various androgens uh, in the, in the uh, cortex. The kidney is also an endocrine organ. We talked about that a little bit in terms of calcitriol in the first chapter, I believe. Uh, we will talk about it a little bit more in erythropoietin uh, when we get to the uh, urinary chapter. Uh, is that later this week or maybe next week? Adipose tissue. Uh, Throughout the body is responsible for producing leptin. GI tract has a host of hormones related to uh, di digestion. This includes the pancreas. Um, and then, of course, the, the gonads, testes and ovaries uh, in males and females. All right. So let's review the types of, uh, of intercellular communication that we have. We can have direct communication between cells. This is through... Uh, the presence of gap junctions. So two cells are adjacent. They have those um, grommets that are like the metal, uh, you know, the, the little channels, the pores that make them synstitial. So whatever's going on in the cytoplasm of one is going on in the cytoplasm of the other. Then there's paracrine uh, communication. Paracrine communication is uh, where one cell is releasing its contents into the interstitium and then affecting adjacent cells. Okay, so it doesn't, it's very, very local uh, in a tissue. It's not uh, spreading through the bloodstream at all. Then finally, uh, the, the next is the endocrine communication. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today, where the cells uh, release their uh, hormones, their neurotransmitters, whatever they are, into the bloodstream for uh, targeting.
uh, tissue uh, somewhere else in the body. And then finally, synaptic communication is, is another form of intercellular communication. We will actually briefly talk about uh, how a type of synapt synaptic communication is used in the neurohypothesis for the release of oxytocin, oxytocin and ADH um, there today. So, all right. So I'm going to take a, a little bit of time to discuss the structure and uh, mechanism of the mechanistic correlations of some of these hormones. So first, just looking at the structure as an overview. Uh, hormones can be broken up into three broad biosynthetic categories. Uh, the first uh, of those is uh, based upon amino acids. So there are the 20 amino acids, um, and two of them are responsible for uh, producing various hormones. Those are tyrosine, uh, which give us the catecholamines and the thyroid hormones, and then uh, tryptophan uh, becomes serotonin, serotonin becomes melatonin, uh, so uh, there's a, a cascade of, of hormones that derive from tryptophan as well. Then moving up uh, the scale of complexity, uh, we have a lipid hormone, or I'm sorry, peptide hormones. Um, so these, a peptide is distinguished from proteins by being a little bit shorter, so a peptide is, you know, about 20 to, to 25, 30 uh, amino, ap, uh, amino acids in length. So, um, and these peptides, um, well, okay, so this categorizes them by glycoproteins, which are larger ones, uh, over 200 amino acids. And then these uh, short polypeptides, a, a polypeptide really is about 20 or 30 amino acids, and then they say small proteins, so under 200 amino acids, which certainly is a small protein. Um, so there, you can see there is a, a gradient there, um, and uh, they have a host of uses throughout the body. We'll, we'll talk about a few of those in a bit. Uh, and then finally, lipid deri derivatives. Um, so there's, there's two categories here. Lipid derivatives are basically taking uh, fatty acids and, and cholesterol and, uh, and modifying them in some way to produce either the eicosanoids um, or the steroid hormones. Eicosanoids are, the, the word eicosanoid derives from fish. Eicos means uh, scale, scaly. Um, so it, the fish oils are examples of... Uh, uh, precursors for the eicosanoid uh, hormones. So mechanistically, there's sort of two categories. So I said there's three structural categories, two mechanistic categories, broadly speaking. Uh, there's extracellular uh, signaling and intracellular signaling. signaling. Uh, in terms of extracellular signaling, it's pretty much exclusively these G-protein coupled receptors. Um, so uh, GDP is uh, one of uh, the nucleosides, and it becomes, like A, T, G, and C, uh, GDP uh, becomes associated with a protein, uh, which we then call G proteins. These G proteins then, then themselves uh, associate with a transmembrane receptor, works. Oh, yeah. Uh, these G proteins associate with a protein receptor, uh, which binds to a hormone, uh, activate when, when this binding happens, a conformational shift in the receptor uh, occurs, and it activates this G protein. And when the G protein activates, it uh, interacts with a host of downstream um, effectors that can uh, act via one of two different pathways, either by affecting cyclic AMP, so AMP is another one of the nucleosides, uh, and or uh, calcium, by affecting calcium levels, and calcium can become uh, the signaling. So cyclic AMP and calcium 
are called then second messengers. All right, so these extra, extracellular systems uh, with G protein coupled receptors, uh, this is a second messenger system. So here comes the first uh, messenger, which is that hormone that is going to bind to the protein receptor, activate, uh, activate this G protein that's coupled to it, and this G protein is then going to turn on various second messengers. So it's going to, so cyclic AMP and calcium are the two second messengers that we're talking about. This right here is massive. If you are going to go into biochemistry at all, or even just have to take some biochemistry in your future, this is one of the central paradigms of, of cellular control, these uh, G protein coupled receptor second messenger systems. That's as, that's as simplified as it, it, a schematic as it gets. There is, just involved in, in these little arrows here, it gets super wildly complicated depending upon the specifics of the cell type and the, and the molecular pathway that's being regulated. Um, all right, so that there's a lot of variations on that theme, but that is like the absolute uh, stripped down generalization of that. And then intracellular, uh, we'll, we'll look at how this works. These are basically these guys here and uh, these ones up here. These are lipid soluble steroid and thyroid hormones that are able, uh, because of the presence of these highly conjugated greasy chains or highly conjugated uh, ring systems up here, those are able to pass through the lipid bilayer um, and then move uh, into the cell and directly affect. So they are, that is not second messenger. That's a first mes messenger system where the hormone goes into the cell and is going to directly affect the change uh, on, on the cell. Okay? All right. So first, let's look more closely at cyclic AMP. So uh, here on the left is how uh, a second messenger system using cyclic AMP can activate a cell. So some hormone and this can be, here's some examples, epinephrine and norepinephrine, calcitonin, PTH, antidiuretic hormone, uh, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, all these things, glucagon, there's a long list, there's a laundry list of uh, hormones. These can be glycoproteins, short polypeptides, the catecholamines, uh, or melatonin. Any of these hormones are going to be able to bind some specific protein receptor unique to that hormone. It's going to turn on the G protein. That G protein is going to then turn on adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase. What adenylate cyclase uh, does, so adenylate refers to adenosine, one of the, uh, the four nucleotides. Adenylate cyclase turns ATP, hydrolyzes off two of those phosphates to catalyze, gets the energy from two of the phosphates, and then takes the, the remaining AMP and cyclizes it. So it, uh, it cyclizes the adenosine-containing compound, adenylate cyclase. This, uh, is, this, is catal this is potentiated by the activation of the G protein. And once CAMP uh, gets released into the cell, the CAMP levels go up, this is going to act as a second messenger. And it's going to activate all kinds of kinases. Uh, kinases are proteins that, or enzymes that catalyze uh, the phosphorylation of other proteins. All right. So uh, you can imagine some sort of protein that is is not active. All right. And we want to turn it active. Well, you can stick a phosphate group on that protein and it suddenly turns on. It causes some sort of shift in the protein and, it's, and it turns the switch on. So let's look at, and then once those kinases on, are on, they have a host of downstream actions. So they can open ion channels back at the surface. 
They can activate enzymes, and that is a broad category there, right? So depending on the cell type, what enzymes are out and about, and the specific ligand interaction, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen there. But let's look at the dynamics of that. This kind of makes sense, right? So we have ATP with a bunch of phosphate gets hydrolyzed and then cyclized into cyclic AMP. Cyclic, when the cyclic AMP goes up, what else is going up in the, in the pool? What else is going up in the pool there? To make cyclic AMP, what else had to go up in the, in the soluble pool? Free phosphate groups, thank you. And so, and these, these kinases that are getting activated, they're taking phosphate groups and they're sticking them on enzymes and ion channels. So you see how this, the system uh, works here? Uh, let's look at the other side. So it, these hormones uh, through this cyclic AMP don't always have to work to activate a cell. They can throttle a cell back. They can throttle a cell back as well, depending upon the cell type. So, um, and, and, the, and the cell type and the type of protein receptor that that cell type is expressing. So here's some kind of cell where we have a hormone come in, and epinephrine and norepinephrine are examples, uh, where they bind to this protein receptor, activate a G protein. This G protein is associated now not with adenylate cyclase, uh, but with phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase uh, is a protein that cleaves the phosphodiester bond that was formed by adenylate cyclase. So phosphodiesterase cleaves the phosphodiester bond uh, that makes this cyclized and releases AMP. Um, and when that happens, first of all, cyclic AMP levels fall off a cliff, and any kind of downstream activities uh, that are happening, happening because of the presence of cyclic AMP uh, slow down. The sharp among you may notice that I have epinephrine, norepinephrine on both sides of these lists. Well, what is it? Or is, is, is epinephrine and norepinephrine increasing? So another word for epinephrine is, the old word is adrenaline, right? Adrenaline. Is adrenaline activating cells or is it uh, throttling the cells back? What's happening? It depends on the protein receptor that it's binding. So uh, I may have touched on it, or I made a, may have slid past one of the slides in a previous lecture. I think in the neuro chapter, the CNS-PNS chapter, I talked about, uh, there was a slide in there that I might not have gotten to because it was at the end, where I talk about the various categories of uh, receptors out there. Um, and here, epinephrine is going to, bind to an uh, alpha-2 type receptor, and over here it would be a beta, some type of beta receptor, any kind of beta receptor. They're just, there are various categories of types of receptors that are going to have uh, effects on, uh, on the uh, second messenger system that's getting activated uh, by the binding of those hormones. All right. So, here is the second category of uh, uh, second messenger signaling, uh, where instead of cyclic AMP, we're going to use calcium. Uh, and cal this gets a, a little bit more sophisticated. In fact, it's, it's not really any more sophisticated. It's just that um, back here with cyclic AMP, there are so many variations. There are so many variations uh, depending upon the receptor and the, and the hormone and the cell type uh, and the pathway you're using. There's just so many variations that they strip it back to the only common elements. In calcium, the, wh whatever cell is being stimulated, uh, it looks pretty similar from cell to cell, and so there's a lot more common elements here, and so they included more in the generalized schematic of it, okay? Um, we have some kind of hormone. It's going to bind to a protein receptor. 
Uh, and look at on our list, epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, exist here as well. Broadly effective uh, hormones, uh, ho uh, hormones that have an effect uh, on wide on a wide variety of tissues throughout the body. So here, if the cells are expressing what are called alpha one receptors. Uh, it's going to activate the G protein that's associated with that receptor. And this G protein now is not going to uh, activate adenylate cyclase. It's not going to uh, activate uh, phosphodiesterase. It's going to activate um, phospholipase C. Uh, phospholipase uh, is a protein that cleaves phospholipase C is a protein that's going to cleave um, a phosphate group off of a phospholipid, all right? So uh, phospholipase C gets turned on and has two different pathways for action. Uh, the first is through inositol uh, triphosphate, um, and that uh, gets cleaved off. This inositol triphosphate is a very polar uh, head group from these lipids. Uh, this, uh, this phosphate group then can go into solution very easily. So this is the polar part of this lipid that's getting cleaved by phospholipase. This polar bit goes into solution and directly uh, releases calcium from endoplasmic reticulum and other vesicular storage. All right, so that uh, releases all that calcium right into the cytosol. The greasy part of the lipid that uh, has gotten hydrolyzed by uh, phospholipase C is called diacylglyceride, DAG. Diacylglyceride um, uh, acts on protein kinase C. So this is another kinase. A kinase, the, the two, there's these two categories of enzymes uh, that have contrasting, opposing functions. One are kinases and the other are phosphatases. Phosphatases is a, is a broad category that takes phosphate off, uh, cleaves a phosphate, and a kinase puts a phosphate group on. Okay? So a kinase, uh, the, this uh, phospho, uh, pro, I'm sorry, protein kinase C uh, is going to uh, phosphorylate um, this channel, and in so doing, uh, open up this channel and allow calcium to flood into the cell. So there are, there obviously must be constitutively active um, channels that are pumping calcium, sequestering calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum. There must be channels that are pumping calcium out of the cell. We turn this channel on, calcium floods into the uh, cell, cytoplasm through down its electrochemical gradient and out of uh, these vesicles uh, down it, its uh, gradient as well. All right. So once all this calcium is in the cell, then uh, it attaches to calmodulin. Calmodulin. This is another calcium binding regulatory molecule. Uh, we've talked about calcitonin. We've talked about calcitriol. This is not those. This is calmodulin. It's a different intracellular uh, calcium binding uh, second messenger. So this is a uh, and this represents the second messenger uh, that then has all these downstream effects, okay? So this is just, all of this are just the two ways that we turn on the second messenger. Uh, and it's basically by taking a, a, a lipid, cutting it into its two halves, one which is uh, water-soluble or polar, and the other which is, uh, is hydrophobic and uh, apolar, and those have two different mechanisms for allowing calcium to come in. The, the, the water-soluble one is going to release from the endoplasmic reticulum, and the lipid-soluble uh, diacylglyceride is going to open up uh, channels in the membrane and let calcium in from the outside. Does that make sense? Pretty incredible that all of this evolved. Uh, it's just... The human body in the in, in the like exquisite detail and and elegant nuance of its molecular mechanisms is just humbling. It's humbling. It's humbling. Humbling.
All right. So next, uh, that's the second messenger system. That is the extracellular form of control. Now we're going to the intracellular forms of control. And there's two, of, two types of these, right? Uh, so there's going to be the steroid hormones and the thyroid hormones. First, the steroid hormones. Uh, step one, we have some kind of steroid hormone. This can be, there's a whole host of these. There, it's testosterone, estrogen, any of the androgens. Uh, oh, here's a list, yeah. So uh, calcitriol, uh, the glucocorticoids like um, cortisone or whatever, uh, the mineral corticoids, the, an yeah, the androgens, uh, got, got all of those. So uh, these are all essentially derivatives of cholesterol. So cholesterol uh, is essential, is in this, an essential uh, compound in your body that becomes the precursor for a lot of things, uh, one of them being these steroid hormones. Um, so steroid hormone, this is really greasy. This is a conjugated ring system here, a bunch of, of uh, rings that are able to readily pass through a uh, lipid membrane. Probably got here um, uh, riding on the back of some carrier protein so that it could stay in solution. Uh, passes right through that membrane, and as soon as it gets in the cytoplasm, it buddies up. Uh, it can do well, one of two things. It can either buddy up with some sort of receptor um, or in, in the cytosol, or it can go all the way to the nucleus and, and buddy up with the receptor there. Either way, uh, this the steroid hormone receptor complex, uh, the, when the steroid hormone binds to the receptor, it's like a key that changes the conformation of that receptor so that the receptor now fits into uh, some structural motif on DNA. It fits right into uh, the, the DNA, into one of either the major or the minor groove on DNA. And when that happens, uh, it activates the tr a transcription process. So this often is a transcription factor that it's binding to. And when this binds to the DNA, it turns transcription on. All right. Uh, when the gene becomes activated, we're going to start uh, transcribing uh, the DNA into RNA. We're going to start making RNA out of the DNA. And this messenger RNA, uh, once, once this happens, then we get translation into proteins, uh, protein synthesis, and though that those proteins are going to do whatever they do. Uh, maybe they are. Uh, maybe this is an, uh, a glandular epithelial cell, and it's and it, that protein is for export. Uh, maybe it is some kind of receptor on the surface of that that's going to change the function of this cell. Maybe it's something that's happening. This protein is something that's doing has a function in the, inside the cell, uh, all right? So uh, this is steroid hormone action. And, and the specifics of this, of course, are, uh, are related to cell type, hormone uh, identity, and the receptor that it's binding to. All right, now the thyroid hormones. Thyroid hormones, uh, there's... there's uh, the big one here is T4. Uh, th thyroid hormones control so much in your body. That's why uh, thyroid hypothyroidism is such a, a big problem. Uh, it affects more women than men. We'll talk about that in a bit. So, like the steroid hormones, here, here is... Uh, here is a picture of T4, thyroxine, and uh, we have these benzene rings that, uh, that are very greasy. They have a lot of pi electrons, and they're able to pass right through uh, this, this outer uh, envelope. Bind to, there, so there's two mechanisms here. Uh, there is a cytosolic and a nuclear pathway uh, in, in thyroid hormones, depending upon the cell type. So, step one, uh, 
binds to some kind of receptor in the mitochondria. The, the uh, goal of this is to increase ATP production. Um, so when you have an increase in ATP, that's going to drive some sort of cellular uh, activity. Mitochondria have their own complete set of DNA that is separate from the DNA that's in the nucleus. Are, are you guys aware of that? Yeah. So you guys at this point in time have probably heard about how mitochondria uh, were an independently living bacteria that uh, commensalistically invaded eukaryotic cells and, and took up residency. Okay, well, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the semester anyways. But the second mechanism is uh, these thyroid hormones uh, come into the nucleus and bind some kind of transcription factor uh, in the nucleus. And in much, at this point, it's identical to the steroid hormone pathway, all right? So we get activation, gene activation, uh, transcription, translation, synthesis, and downstream effects of those proteins, whatever they are, right? Okay, so that was a, a fairly comprehensive overview of uh, the signaling mechanisms of the endocrine system. Now let's look at the top of the pyramid, the pituitary gland. Um, the basic anatomy first. Uh, it, here we see it uh, sticking down from this infundibulum, this little funnel-shaped piece of uh, brain tissue uh, inferior to the hypothalamus. Then the body of uh, the body of the pituitary, the hypothesis, sitting in uh, the cella tersica of the sphenoid bone. Your nasal sinus is right here. Um, and this hypothesis is broken up into two large uh, subdivisions with a, a very small uh, intermediate slice of tissue right here. Uh, these are the uh, anterior adenohypophysis and the posterior neurohypophysis. Okay? And histologically, they really look very different. It's quite easy to distinguish them uh, from one another. On, on histological examination. So uh, I'm not going to go into the, the uh, distinction between all those tissue uh, subdivisions there. Here's a diagram, and I, I debated whether to include this picture or not. Uh, here's a diagram of the uh, hypophyseal portal system, the blood supply to the pituitary gland. I decided to include it uh, only to emphasize the point that um, this, this is really essential to the function of the pituitary gland, right? It's not just to keep the pituitary alive, of course, uh, with the nutrients it needs, but this is how the pituitary functions. It's, got a, it's an endocrine organ. It releases all these hormones into the bloodstream. It needs to have a very robust uh, blood supply to be able to distribute its uh, hormones uh, throughout the body. So um, blood comes in and, uh, and comes to the adenohypophysis. There is a second, uh, there's a second uh, blood vessel that is supplying the neurohypophysis. So these two um, portions of the hypothesis are, are relatively isolated uh, from one another. All right. I, at the beginning, talked about how the, the hypothalamus is actually uh, at the top of the pyramid. And, and I don't know what the, the pyramid breaks down a little bit here. Uh, the hypothalamus is the higher order structure in the brain that is, is giving the input and the control down into uh, the pituitary gland. All right, so it, ha it has three different mechanisms of uh, control over endocrine function. Two of those 
uh, involve the pituitary, and then there's a third uh, separate pathway. Uh, the first is these uh, releasing hormones, these regulatory uh, hormones that are going to go, that are produced here, uh, go through the portal system uh, into the adenohypophysis, and then cause, uh, stimulate these cells to give uh, a downstream hormonal effect, and we'll see what those are in the next slide. Uh, the second me mechanism is uh, in effect over the neural hypo hypothesis. So the hy uh, hypothalamus produces antidiuretic hormone, okay, uh, which is going to which is going to control water retention. Oxytocin. Um, these hormones are produced in the cell bodies of the hypothalamus. And then uh, by anterograde transport, they're put into vesicles and shuttled down the axons of uh, these nerve projections through the infundibulum into the neurohypophysis, where these vesicles full of the ADH and oxytocin that was synthesized up here are going to get released into the uh, hypophyseal portal system uh, down in the neurohypophysis. Okay, so that's the second method. Third is uh, there are uh, preganglionic uh, nerve cell bodies for the sympathetic uh, uh, nervous system that reside here in the hypothalamus. These preganglionic fibers are going to go down, and they're, they're cutting out the uh, sympathetic chain ganglia here, but these are not actually direct connections. There's going to be a, sy a synapse in what are called the sympathetic chain ganglia. There's a chain of ganglia along your spine for the sympathetic nervous system. We're going to have a, a synapse there, and then these, uh, these fibers are going to come and, and project into the cortex of the, or I'm pardon me, the, the medulla of the uh, suprarenal gland. This is where we're going to get epinephrine and, and norepinephrine. All right. So that's how the thalamus or the hypothalamus affects the pituitary gland, what happens then? So here is, a con here is the control uh, mechanism, the general pattern, and it, it, and it plays out in many instances. We have uh, some kind of releasing hormone that is going to affect the adenohypophysis. It's been produced up here uh, by some cell body in the hypothalamus. It's making some kind of releasing hormone and, uh, and it affects the adenohypophysis. The adenohypophysis uh, then produces, those cells produce some kind of uh, ho primary hormone which is released into the bloodstream, hits uh, an effector organ, whatever that is. It can be the, the suprarenal cortex, it can be uh, your gonads, whatever, there's a list. And then those endocrine organs produce a secondary hormone, which is going to be released into the body and hit some target cells. So this is some kind of endocrine organ somewhere uh, in the body, and it's going to make a hormone that's going to give us the downstream uh, effects. This secondary hormone, it's... One of its functions is not just on the, on the target effector, but it's also on, it acts as a negative feedback. So it goes through the bloodstream, cycles back to the hypothalamus, and down-regulates the release of this releasing hormone. Okay? It down-regulates the production of that re releasing hormone. It also inhibits uh, the production of this primary hormone. Uh, in the adenohypophysis, okay? So this is uh, a, negative, a negative feedback loop. Uh, and here are some examples. So uh, for the thyroid gland, we have uh, the thyroid releasing hormone that's produced in the hypothalamus. It uh, activates the production of the thyroid stimulating hormone in the adenohypophysis. That goes through the bloodstream, hits the thyroid. Thyroid produces T3, T4. Uh, those do a host of things. 
But one of the things they do is slow down the production of thyroid stimulating hormone and thyroid releasing hormone. Okay? And then the same thing plays out for the suprarenal cortex, the, the gonads, uh, and uh, the ovary. Yeah, so both of these, these are all the gonads. Um, here are some variations on that theme. So, um, here's a prolactone releasing factor. This is going to cause uh, the production of prolactone in the adenohypophysis. This is going to go directly to the, the downstream effector, okay, and, and cause what's called milk letdown. Uh, prolactone, and in parallel to this, is the production of prolactone inhibitory factor. So this is, when this gets made, this also gets made in parallel. This is slowing down the production of uh, prolactone uh, release, uh, slowing down the production of, of prolactone. Um, so prolactone itself is inhibiting prolactone releasing factor and encouraging the production of prolactone inhibitory factor. All right, so the difference between this, that, and this is this hormone 2, this hormone 2 is just be, oops, being taken out of the downstream, because there is no downstream here. There's no extra endocrine tissue uh, besides the mammary gland. It's being taken out of the downstream and just put upstream and, and controlled by the hypothalamus. So if you look, if you look, uh, I mean, th that it, that's not explicitly... Uh, true, because the downstream is not an inhibitory. Uh, it, it, the the prolactone inhibitory hormone has no other function uh, than to slow down the adenohypophysis. But, uh, anyways, it's it's a it's a it's a little bit of a tweak on the on the on the theme. The uh, second one is a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, it has the same uh, it has the same uh, pattern that we saw in the general uh, schematic. However, there's an addition of an inhibitory, uh, there's, uh, of an inhibitory hormone here that um, is getting uh, stimulated in parallel uh, to the releasing hormone. Okay? Um, so, <clears throat> those are the general patterns. Let's look at some of the, the specifics and how uh, these pituitary hormones are going to affect the downstream targets. Here's a, a big uh, diagram of that. So we have the suprarenal gland is getting controlled both by uh, ACTH and directly through the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, and this produces epinephrine and norepinephrine and then the uh, stress hormones right there. Uh, thyroid gland, uh, the downstream T3, T4 growth hormone, and the liver, the somatomedins, which are going to then uh, help your bone and muscle grow. Prolactone, that's the milk letdown. All of the androgens, uh, there's a wide category of those and their, and their downstream effects. Uh, uh, melan uh, melanocyte stimulating hormone uh, can, can, doesn't have uh, an, an, uh, an intermediate uh, downstream the way uh, these gonads do. Oxytocin, the effect on the prostate gland and the uterus, uh, and then uh, antidiuretic hormone and its effect on the kidneys. So. I'm not going to talk about all those glands in detail, but I am going to talk about the thyroid gland in a little bit of in a little bit of detail. Just to remind you, here's the thyroid gland, just uh, anterior uh, and inferior to the thyroid cartilage, sort of uh, bracketing the 
trachea. Lady, so happy to show off her thyroid there. Um, and here's the histology. So if you look closely at a um, uh, tissue slide of the thyroid gland, you're going to see these um, thyroid follicles. It's these, uh, they, in cross-section, they look like tubes, but they're really just bubbles of uh, simple cuboidal epithelial cells that uh, are glandular, of course, and there's a lumen to these, these follicles. In the, the, the follicular cavities, uh, we have a store, it's a, basically a storage uh, container for thyroglobulin. All right, so let's, let's look at how this thyroid hormone is produced in these follicular cavities. Uh, the first thing that is necessary for... Um, for thyroid hormone production is the presence of iodine. And this is why we iodinate our salt. So iodized salt uh, is so that uh, people who, uh, are there any Midwesterners in here? Well, I grew up in Detroit. And um, in the Midwest, you don't have the benefit of uh, living on the coast and eating uh, so much delicious seafood that is loaded with iodine, right? Um, it's, it's not really a problem anymore, but uh, way back when, um, people were getting a condition called goiter, or primary hypothyroidism, because they weren't getting enough iodine in their diet. Their, uh, their thyroid glands were getting hypertrophic, and uh, really large goiterous things uh, were happening to people that lived in Iowa. So they just started iodizing, uh, iodinating the, uh, the salt. Let that, that person in. Or they maybe run into the other side. I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, so sodium chloride is table salt, chloride ion uh, was, is replaced by sodium iodide. It's just another one of the halogens. Um, and then you get enough uh, dietary, uh, you get a, a large enough dietary source of iodide uh, for the production of these thyroid hormones. So first thing that happens is you have some kind of pump here, uh, a, a ion channel that uh, is... Uh, activated by thyroid stimulating hormone. Okay, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone comes in, turns this on, and uh, we have the influx of iodine, which diffuses across uh, the cytoplasm and uh, gets shipped into, get, gets packaged into these vesicles uh, that go into the follicular ca uh, cavity where we have thyroglobulin uh, packed up with it, and it become, thyroglobulin becomes uh, iodinated here in the follicle. It then recycles back uh, via endocytosis uh, these uh, packages, get lysos they merge with uh, lysosomes, and there's lysosomal digestion, where the, the T3 and T4 are released from the protein chains that they've been uh, conjugated to. Um, and we have, uh, meanwhile, a cycle going here where tyrosine and other amino acids are uh, being used to produce thyroglobulin that are merging with uh, the, the iodine into these vesicles and going through the cycle. So thyroglobulin is produced here in the cytosol and then it's amended uh, amended uh, to produce T3 and T4 containing peptides uh, in the follicle. They come in, lysosomal digestion, release of T3, T4, and then they pass out of the, out of the cell into the bloodstream, bind to these uh, uh, thyroid binding globulin uh, proteins, basically transport globulins that are going to take them uh, somewhere else in the body.
So here's a different picture. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find one picture that had everything that I wanted to show. Uh, here is that uh, sodium, uh, that sodium iodine symporter. It's a symporter, meaning that sodium is traveling down its electrochemical gradient, uh, and it's driving iodine up its electrochemical gradient. So the energy that's being released by sodium going down its gradient, because sodium wants to get inside the cell, uh, is offsetting the energy that it takes to pull the iodine in. So we can see there's a net charge neutrality in that transfer, um, and then any extra energy that it, so uh, extra energy from the chemical gradient uh, of the sodium is being used to drive iodine up uh, 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 its up its gradient. So that's how the iodine gets in. It then uh, passes through the cell into the lumen uh, and uh, helps to uh, iodinate these uh, thyroglobulin molecules. So here's a globular protein, a big globular protein, and we have uh, all this uh, thyroxine uh, decorating it. So here's the, the, the thyroglobulin uh, exocytosis, thyroglobulin with all the thyroxine uh, molecules on this big globular protein, iodination, endocytos uh, endocytosis uh, merges with a lysosome, lysosomal degradation of the protein, the globular protein gets broken down and recycled, and now we have mature uh, T3 and T4. So we can see why it's called T3 triiodothyronine, it has one, two, three iodines, and T4 has one, two, three, four iodines on it. All right. So, for just one molecule of this hormone, we need four iodines, uh, iodide ions. Quite a significant requirement um, for iodine in the body. So then uh, it's pumped out into the blood, where it binds to the transport, uh, the TPG, the the, the transport molecule. All right, how do we regulate uh, this secretion? Well, we've already uh, sort of talked about that. Here's a homeostatic pathway. We get the thyroid releasing hormone, the adenohypophysis produces uh, the thyroid stimulating hormone. It's going to go down to the thyroid gland, open up the doors uh, to the uh, open up the doors to the iodine channels and stimulate the production of uh, uh, thyroxine, and eventually T3 and T4. This gets released. Um, I should have started here, I guess. Uh, we have homeostasis. Disturbance is when we have a decrease in T3 and T4 concentrations in the body. Uh, another thing that can set this off is low body temperature. If your, body, if your core temperature drops too low, it's going to stimulate uh, the thyroid hormones. Um, then we go down here, we produce more, uh, we get up to normal T3, T4 concentrations, and we're going to throttle back on, on that. All right, so why am I putting so much time into the thyroid gland? The thyroid gland is huge. It's huge. Uh, for people with hypothyroidism, it's, it's a, they have a host of problems. Uh, and that should be evident just at, in, in this slide here. So let's just look down the, the slide. So elevated rates, uh, so what does the thyroid hormone do? It gives us uh, eleva elevated rates of uh, oxygen consumption and energy consumption, particularly in children, can affect body temperature. It's going to help regulate your breathing. It, it uh, is going to affect your heart rate um, and the contractility of the heart tissue. Uh, because of that, there's a downstream rise in blood pressure by uh, the increased uh, action of thyroid hormo hormones. Um, it's upregulating the sen sensitivity of tissue to sympathetic stimulation. Um, yeah, it helps th the baseline tonus of the respiratory system. Um, it's going to stimulate erythropoiesis. Uh, what else here? Uh, there's other endocrine tissue that's going to be activated uh, by it. It's going to turn over, it's going to accelerate the turnover of minerals in the bone. Uh, 
Um, and I put some other ones down here that weren't included in your books list. It has other uh, effects broadly distributed throughout the CNS and PNS. It can affect your body weight, uh, the, your muscle strength. Thyroid hormones uh, affect uh, your, your menstrual cycles. They, they attenuate the menstrual cycle. I think we already mentioned body temperature can also have uh, an effect on the circulating cholesterol levels. So thyroid hormones are really important. This is the down, is the bottom line. Parathyroid gland, uh, I don't think I'm going to talk about that too much. Uh, this is just a review uh, of the first day of class where we talked about uh, the role uh, that the parathyroid gland played in calcium homeostasis along with the thyroid, uh, horm uh, the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland, besides T3 and T4, it also produces calcitonin. Um, which is used to bring the levels of calcium in the blood down. And the parathyroid gland uh, produces PTH, which increases uh, circulating levels of calcium. Yeah? What does that say where it says uncertain significance in a healthy non-pregnant adult? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if you have r relatively high le circulating levels of uh, of calcium, that's typically not a, a, a big deal. I showed that one chart uh, during that chapter that showed the two uh, examples of pathology that can lead to uh, increased uh, calcium. So, in a typical person who has a nice high uh, level of calcium, healthy but high level of calcium, uh, when you begin, if, if the calcium is too high for whatever reason, uh, if you begin to add more bone deposition uh, by the, the uh, slowing down of osteoclasts in a normal person, not in a person with like osteogenesis imperfecta or whatever, something like that, um, it doesn't really, they don't really know. They don't really know what the significance of increasing your bone density is in a, a healthy individual. There are just some individuals uh, who may have a higher, uh, who, who may be prone to higher circulating levels of calcium, and then that gets deposited in bone. Most people have the opposite problem, in, at least in our modern society, where they have uh, bone degradation. So dropping levels of calcium and uh, bone, bone, you know, osteopenia or whatever, bone wasting. If, you're, if your bone density is going up and you're not pregnant uh, and you're otherwise healthy, they don't, there's not really any pathology associated with it. So I think that's what that means. All right, um, the, the kidneys, why do I call this review? Oh yeah, so it talks about <clears throat> we'll talk about, we, we've talked about calcitriol, we'll talk about renin and erythropoietin, the other uh, hormones of the, the kidney in the kidney chapter. Uh, but this calcitriol, uh, along with PTH, we've already talked about that in terms of uh, calcium homeostasis. So th this whole thing is just a review in terms of the effects on absorption uh, of calcium through the gut and excretion uh, by the kidneys. All right, so here is a bit of a preview uh, of the, the renin angiotensin system in the kidneys. Um, we start here. We have normal blood pressure uh, and volume. <clears throat> uh, that decreases for some, for some reason. Uh, why does your blood pressure decrease? Maybe, uh, maybe you have injured yourself. Uh, and you, you 
you've lost some blood. Well, um, that's going to stimulate the kidneys to do two things. It's going to, first of all, uh, produce erythropoietin. That's going to, uh, the kidney's going to make erythropoietin, uh, which is going to make red blood cells. You know, this, this hormone's going to go to the long bones and uh, in ch children and the uh, axial skeleton in adults and increase red blood cell production there and in the spleen. And that's going to help uh, bring the blood pressure back up. Uh, the other one is renin. And renin is going to jump into this complicated uh, pathway. This is actually a little bit of a simplification as well. Uh, when you have all these arrows sort of joining enigmatically together, you can imagine. Um, but this is the angiotensin cascade. Uh, and the, the upshot of this is uh, an increase in fluid retention, meaning what? what is, what's an increase in fluid retention? How, what's one way that you can retain fluid? The kidneys can resorb more of the fluid, right? So this, this renin is going to go through this pathway that's going to affect itself, uh, fluid retention, and the second is increased fluid intake. Uh, what is that called? Marco Rubio knows about it. Is that you that was? Yeah. It's thirst. This is thirst. Uh, and then, so we bring more fluid on board, uh, and we increase the uh, blood pressure. So uh, renin is increasing. The plasma, the plasma aspect of the blood, and erythropoietin is uh, impacting the hematocrit. So uh, erythropoietin increasing hematocrit, renin increasing plasma. All right, on to the suprarenal glands. Um, they live above the kidneys. Superior to the right and left kidneys. And they have two, broadly speaking, two regions. The cortex or outside and medulla or inner portion. The cortex is broken up into these subdivisions here, uh, which I'm not going to ask you to identify. But uh, they are significant not just because of their uh, histological um, in, uh, histological uh, distinction, but because each of these areas that looks different under the slide produces uh, different uh, types of hormones. So we have uh, aldosterone, which is one of the mineral corticoids, uh, the stress hormones, the glucocorticoids, and the androgens uh, being produced out in the cortex. And then the medulla is where we get epinephrine and, and norepinephrine. <clears throat> All right. The pancreas. Um, we will talk about uh, the pancreas a little more in the digestive chapter. Um, the pancreatic, when we get there, we'll talk about the pancreatic uh, islets. So uh, there, the pancreas is both an endocrine and an exocrine uh, organ. The en exocrine tissue are these uh, acini, these acini cells. And then there are these islets that you see here as well, a pancreatic islet. There are two types of cells there, alpha and beta cells. Uh, the m majority of them are beta cells. This is where we make uh, insulin. Uh, but glucagon is produced in the alpha cells. Um, and so the role of uh, the alpha and beta cells, the pancreatic islets, is uh, in control of blue blood glucose levels. Uh, so when you have a rise in blood glucose, uh, beta cells make insulin, which has a host of... Uh, has a host of functions, primarily uh, stimulating glucose uptake uh, by uh, cells in the body. And then uh, if you have a declining blood glucose, uh, 
we have glucagon production. And glucagon uh, stimulates the breakdown of glycogen to glucose in the liver and, the, and your muscle tissue. So I remember I told you guys that glycogen is a storage molecule for uh, glucose. It's just a long polymeric chain of glucose. Um, and it's going to also have some effects on other central metabolism uh, of, of fats and uh, the release of glucose. So glucagon and insulin are sort of uh, opposite hormones. Okay. Oh, yeah, here it is. So here's some pathology. I might be at the end, towards the end of my talk here. Um, Graves' disease, uh, also called toxic diffuse goiter. Uh, this is an autoimmune disease of the thyroid. Uh, my mother-in-law has it, although uh, this is not my mother-in-law. <clears throat> um, um, she does demonstrate this goiter here, and uh, there's this common problem uh, with the bulging eyes. So um, this is due to uh, an enlargement of the fat tissue in uh, the, the orbital uh, fat tissue, and the eyes uh, get pushed out of the socket. It can uh, be very deleterious to the retina. These people can have... Uh, can have vision loss if it's not uh, treated. Um, so what are the symptoms? Hyperthyroidism, uh, goiter is your enlarged goiter. These people aren't very happy. They're irritable. Uh, they have uh, muscle paresis or weakness. Uh, they don't sleep well. Um, and in fact, part of the bad sleeping is be, uh, because they have this problem, they often are, it's indicated for them to sleep sitting up, so they're not able to lie down because laying down can uh, exacerbate this problem. So on top of having uh, insomnia, they aren't able to actually lay down properly. Uh, they have uh, tachycardia or a racing heart. They don't like heat very well, and a host of other uh, problems. So uh, the bulk of, uh, so six women are six times as likely as men to have this disorder. And here are some uh, famous people uh, who've had it. That is uh, what Ronnie Dangerfield, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, no, 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 what's his name? It was in Young Frankenstein, I forget his name. He's holding a brain there. Uh, Barbara Bush, and what's her name? Help me out, please. Do you know her? She's that. She's a singer. Um, what's that? Missy Thank you. Yep, that was Missy Elliott. She, both uh, Barbara Bush and Missy Elliott have um, Graves' disease. Uh, it was actually first, so the, it, it's named after this guy, Robert James Graves, uh, who described the first European case in 1835. Uh, but, uh, so the European sticks his name on it, but of course, uh, somebody else got to it first. Uh, this was, this is our, our buddy, um, well, here he's called Al, uh, Giorgiani, uh, it, Ali Itman or whatever his name was. I forget the other name I viewed. He had, he went by a number of names. Same guy, uh, in the 11th century, uh, actually described it in his medical textbook of the time. He was the first person to, uh, have recorded uh, an observation and management of uh, this disorder. Uh, how do they deal with it? Well, um, <clears throat> radioiodine therapy, they take radioactive iodine, which localizes the thyroid, so it's sort of like targeted uh, radiation therapy. Um, they, there are medications which are moderately effective uh, and, or they can just do a thyrectomy. And these people who've had their thyroid removed are going to have to be on T3, T4 uh, supplements the rest of their life. Um, <clears throat> maybe I skipped over this part. What's interesting about it is that uh, it's an autoimmune disease that is uh, potentiated by this uh, TSI, this immunoglobulin uh, 
that looks like thyroid stimulating hormone, right? So there's a thyroid stimulating hormone, and then the, the uh, antibody, the antigen recognition portion of this TSI, this antibody, looks like and binds to, uh, it looks like and binds to the uh, iodine channel, the sodium iodine symporter, and activates it in much the same way as TSH would. So uh, pr pretty interesting uh, how the, the pathogenesis of that disease. That's it. Uh, are there any questions?